Let me say how delighted I am to be here this evening, and this for two reasons. First, you are honoring the late Reggie Dumas, one of the founders of Transparency International Trinidad and Tobago, who departed this life on March the 8th. It gives me an opportunity to say a few words about Reggie. Reggie was some 18 years older than me, but I came to know him in the latter years of his public service career when I was at the Central Bank and he was ensconced in the higher reaches of the public service. My connection with him deepened later on when he was on the board of CCN, a subsidiary of OCM, where I served for a couple of years as CEO. Over the years, he became a great friend and advisor, someone whom I could bounce ideas off and be sure to be guided and enlightened by the conversation. I was chuffed when he would call me to ask my opinion or my advice. I was excited when he began to write his memoirs. It is so vitally important, I think, that we document our histories through the eyes of those who made it, and Reggie's public service as a diplomat and senior public servant happened during a very exciting period in our history. In 2015, I wrote a review of his first volume and encouraged him to press on, especially when he seemed to have slowed down a bit with the third volume. I am hopeful that this third and last volume can be published soon, and I understand from his daughter Sonia that it will soon be published. Also in 2015, I addressed this organization's anti-corruption conference on principled leadership to fix our broken institutions. In that address, I identified courage as one of the attributes we needed in our society. And I made bold to identify seven persons whom I considered courageous. Reggie Dumas was the first person I named. The Constitution Reform Committee, of which I am a member, was announced in January. And at our initial meetings, in drawing up a list of persons that we would like to invite to meet with us, Reggie was, of course, on that list, though he doubted publicly that the committee would amount to much. When I got the news of his illness and his urgent need for blood, I went to donate, something I had never done before in my life. After his passing, the volume of praise from all quarters was simply tremendous, and many people recounted the special relationship they had with him. Such was the man that he could make everyone feel with whom, those with whom he interacted and gave the benefit of his wisdom that he made each of them feel special and privileged. He was small in stature, but a giant in intellect, integrity, and service to Trinidad and Tobago. It is people like Reggie Dumas who give me hope, give us hope that we can reset this country and realize its true potential. The second reason I am happy to be here is that your theme, Restoration of the People's Trust Legislative Imperatives, allows me to revisit the question of trust. As I mentioned, I am currently part of a team which is soliciting the views of the public with a view for the fifth time since 1976 to make proposals for constitution reform. The constitution is, of course, law. It is the supreme law, or at least it's supposed to be. But a constitution is far more than legislation. It is many things. It is a statement of our identity as a people. It is a contract among ourselves as to how we wish to be governed. It is a statement of our values and our aspirations. Our committee has solicited the views of the public and held 14 town hall meetings and three youth forums. Contrary to media reports, the response overall has been excellent. There were some meetings where we had less than 20 participants, but the quality of the contributions has been excellent. 
we received about 900 email submissions. There are many people who are cynical and jaded, and many who cannot see the connection between the Constitution and their daily lives. Let me try to explain how significant our Constitution is. Last week, early last week, Justice Robin Mohammed handed down an impressive judgment. It concerned a domestic violence matter where the woman ended up dead and her assailant, her intimate partner, committed suicide, leaving a young child without parents. This is not an unfamiliar story. Between 2010 and 2022, there were 23,498 reports of domestic violence to the police. Of these, there were 381 murders, the vast majority women and girls. What does that have to do with the Constitution? Well, the victim's mother brought a constitutional claim to the court that her daughter's right to life which is the first right we find in the Constitution. Her daughter's right to life had not been protected by the state. You see, she had on multiple occasions complained to the police about the man's violent conduct. She had gone to the magistrate's court to get a protection order against him. The judge, Robin Mohammed, found that the police and the magistrate had a positive duty to protect her. And both organs of the state, the police and the judiciary, failed in their duty to protect her, and she lost her life. What that court found, and what other court judgments have found, is that we in this society are insufficiently diligent. We are indifferent. And we suffer from what Judge Peter Rajkumar, in another matter, termed institutional inertia. Most of the time, that just leads to poor public service. We complain, we cuss, and then we shrug. In some instances, though, it leads to children being incarcerated in adult prisons, or it leads to death and an awful child, orphaned child, as occurred in the case I just recounted. What is it about our society that produces these outcomes? The diagnostic, I think, is that we are a low trust society. Trinidad and Tobago participated in the World Value Survey in 2010 to 2014. Asked whether most people can be trusted, only 3.2% of respondents in Trinidad and Tobago said yes, most people can be trusted, compared to a global average of 32.5%. 96.3% of respondents in Trinidad and Tobago said one had to be careful, compared with a global average of 65.5%. Nigel Henry of Solution by Simulation used to conduct surveys of trust and confidence in our institutions. Over 2016 to 2018, none of the institutions got a net positive rating except for the Office of the President. And if that survey were done today, I am sure that the Office of the President would also yield a net negative rating for trust and confidence. But what is trust? I adopt the definition of Francis Fukuyama. He says, trust is the expectation that arises within a community of regular, honest, and cooperative behavior based on commonly shared norms on the part of members of that community. The norms are about deeply held values such as justice and peace, solidarity, 
as well as the upholding of professional standards and codes of conduct. When we enter an aircraft door, we trust the pilots to maintain professional standards in flying. We don't think about it. We trust the surgeon to do the same when we are unconscious and under his scalpel. We trust our judges and our magistrates to be fair and impartial in dealing with our case. We trust the restaurant, including the Radisson here tonight, to prepare fresh, uncontaminated food for us to consume. Our low trust score as a society indicates that we do not believe that people generally, or maybe some people, can be trusted. Why do we not trust each other? One obvious answer is ethnic differences and ethnic competition. People who are not of our ethnicity are the others, the them who are opposed to the we, and who are invested with all manner of negative stereotyped attributes. In Trinidad and Tobago, ethnic difference is usually nuanced or muted, and this allows us to interact non-violently, sometimes even cooperatively, and sometimes intimately, evidenced by our large mixed population, who, in the lyrics of the mighty Dogla, you recall, uh, neither one nor the other, six of one, half a dozen of the other. Another answer explaining our low trust, trust is class differences. We are a strongly hierarchical society, stratified by class, which is often highly correlated with color or complexion. As I've discussed elsewhere, the wellsprings of hierarchy in our society is a powerful desire for status. In a society where everybody thinks they are seen by everybody else as second class, status is driven by a desire to be recognized, to be somebody. But the other reason for our lack of trust is that our institutions, our systems, our processes do not work well. This, in my view, is due to four related factors. First, many of our institutions are of colonial vintage, designed for a British society 60 or more years ago. As we've gone around the country on this constitutional reform exercise in these town halls, I've been pointing out to people that the Constitution of Trinidad and Tobago, which dates from 1976, is in fact the 1962 Constitution from independence. So we are operating in 2024 with really a constitution that was given to us by the British in independence very hurriedly, very hurriedly because the Federation broke up in 1961 and everybody rushed, Jamaica and ourselves, rushed to Marlborough House to get independence. And we did the constitution in the space of a couple of months in 1962. So we are operating in 2024 with a set of British institutions which date back to the 1950s, some of them including the service commissions dating back to the pre-independence period. So the service commissions are a pre-independence British design based on a 19th century view of the role of the public service and the public servant. I have described this construct elsewhere as a managerial absurdity, where the employer of the public servant is not the person who appoints, transfers, promotes, and disciplines the public servant, and neither of those is the manager of the conduct and performance of the public servant. The world has moved on, requiring a dynamic, proactive public service. In the meantime, we remain stuck in an early 20th century model of the civil service. Secondly, second reason, we imported the hardware of those institutions, but not the software. That is the culture and the conventions that made those institutions work 
in their British context. With British-made institutions, what you see is not what you get. This is because the British culturally had a way of working and interacting which they didn't write down, but everyone knew how to behave, what to do, and what not to do. We took what they wrote down, but we were largely ignorant of the unspoken and unwritten ways in which they made things work. No wonder that we have had multiple conflicts between constitutional office holders over the years, up to the most recent conflict involving the Auditor General, the Minister of Finance, and the Attorney General. Many of these end up in the courts or in commissions of inquiries. The third reason is that when these institutions fail to deliver the results that they are intended to deliver, our cultural response has been to subvert their operations by finding ways around their dysfunctional operation in order to get what we want or what we think we deserve. This will often involve engaging in corrupt practices to achieve our objectives. Grease hand, Bob all, and so on. I do not need to give examples here. They are the daily lived experiences of citizens traversing the licensing office, customs, inland revenue, state lands, quarrying operations, and so on. Corruption in our society is endemic. We break the rules because we observe that the rules are either not applied at all or not applied equitably. The fourth reason is that the operators of these institutions and systems are predominantly concerned with their own selfish personal or communal interests and are indifferent to their obligation to serve the public or the customer to the best of their ability. This is what the victim of Justice Muhammad's case encountered, indifference and selfishness. Since the poor service, the insensitivity, the delay, the inertia have become the dominant narrative in our society, it should be no surprise, therefore, that citizens come to have little or no trust in our institutions, even if they may have had no direct experience of their dysfunctional operation. We expect indifference and inefficiency and our expectations are rarely disappointed. Your theme speaks to the restoration of trust. I suggest it is not a restoration project, but a building project. You can't restore what we've never really had here. Can legislation help in the project of building trust in our society? Can constitutional reform help? Fukuyama, Francis Fukuyama opined that, and I quote, a strong and stable family structure and durable social institutions cannot be legislated into existence. He goes on, a thriving civil society depends on a people's habits, customs, and ethics, attributes which can only be shaped indirectly through conscious political action and must otherwise be nourished through an increased awareness and respect for culture. If one looks at the legislated attempts at dealing with integrity and corruption here, one is tempted to agree with Fukuyama. The Integrity in Public Life Act was passed in 2000 and operationalized in 2005. From the time I looked at the legislation, I realized it was going to be a waste of time and I said so in newspaper articles I wrote in 2006, 2009, and in 2014. The judges and magistrates, happily for them, took themselves out of that legislation because it became predictably a political tool which wrecked a lot of people, including commission members themselves. The legislation was and is deeply flawed and misdirected. The same can be said for the Financial Intelligence Unit, mysteriously or perhaps not so mysteriously, 
located in the Ministry of Finance. At one time, I think it has since been changed, the Anti-Corruption Investigation Bureau, a team of police officers, was located in the office of the Attorney General, a politician. The procurement legislation has been a 10-year saga in which the strong brandy envisaged by protagonists like Afro Raymond has, was diluted to what we now have. But I understand from my friend Mr. Mahabi Singh here that it is working well, so I'm happy to hear that. So what has gone on here? I think it is plain to see that at every turn, the parliament which is dominated and controlled by the executive has opted for the softest and weakest legislation that might satisfy the public that it is dealing with corruption. Parenthetically, the same is true of public service reform, which we have said we want to effect for decades, and from which efforts consultants have made millions, and the public service remains unreformed, defensive, if not unrepentant in its inefficiency. Like Fukuyama, I agree that the problem is cultural. That is what my book, We Like It So, was attempting to analyze. I pointed out there that it is hard for us to see our own culture, and that it is sometimes helpful to see how foreigners see us from the outside, as it were. One wag told me that a foreign diplomat said to him of us, Trinidadians have many ways to tell you no, including yes. How many times have we heard, I come in just now, I just round the corner, and two hours later, he still has not arrived. But then, Lloyd's best question arises. How does a culture escape from itself? I think that legislation, including constitutional reform, can play a critical role in culture change. But a new constitution and anti-corruption legislation has to be designed with the culture in mind. My first argument here is that we are an ambivalent people, but we are also amphibious. Our behaviors are not genetic or hardwired. That is why we can be ambivalent or contingent about issues. But placed in a different environment, we switch and behave differently. So our constitution and anti-corruption legislation has to create a different context that will induce the desired behavior with little or no wiggle room for prevailing attitudes and behaviors to emerge. Secondly, there must be zero tolerance for excuses and poor performance must be visited with swift sanctions or consequences. Airline pilots are not allowed to make excuses. Airline pilots are not allowed to make excuses. They don't come back and say, I'm sorry, the plane crashed. Poor performance should not be rewarded with reappointment. Poor performance should not be rewarded with reappointment. At the same time, excellent performance must be incentivized and appropriately rewarded. Third, and this applies to the Constitution, not ordinary legislation, it should articulate those values, norms, and standards that we as a society embrace and uphold, not contingently or ambivalently, but consistently and unwaveringly. Those values and norms should mean the same for all citizens, which means that they have to be taught from the preschool through to secondary school and reinforced in the workplace. <clears throat> That work must begin now. Fourth, the office holders, the society's elite, <coughs> they whose conduct is observed daily 
by the rest of us must come to understand that they have a special responsibility that goes with office. As they lead, so the rest of the society will follow. If their behavior produces conflict and bacchanal, why should they be surprised that citizens engage in conflict and bacchanal? Behavior that engenders conflict or trickery is inappropriate and our leaders must do better. The TTDI, let me say in closing, has had powerful founders and leaders such as people like Victor Hart, Reggie Dumas, and Boyd Reed, many of whom, Richard Joseph, who was my former classmate at St. Mary's College, and whose legacy of service to the cause of transparency must be honored in the ways in which you carry this important institution forward. I commend the work that you are doing. I commend you to do more. I commend you to engage in voicing, giving voice to the concerns that we have in the society and to point out those situations where our voices as individuals may not be heard, but your voice as an organization, as Transparency International, can and will be heard in the corridors of power. I wish you well as you strive to make Trinidad and Tobago a better, more honest, more caring place where all of us do our duty to each other as we would have it done to us. I thank you for this opportunity to address you this evening. Thank you very much.